Good evening. Good evening to all our friends. I'm so happy to see all of you here. I'm Jennifer Ravin, have the extraordinary privilege of being the president of Hunter College and to welcome two extraordinary leaders tonight, um, our friend Lou Lehrman, whom you'll hear from very shortly, and of course, um, the preeminent uh, visionary and, and really the person who's kept FDR's flame alive, Bill Vanden Heuvel. Um, we are so grateful that Bill supported our efforts to help restore this extraordinary home. It was Bill Vanden Heuvel who brought us the truly remarkable Four Freedoms Park uh, on Roosevelt Island and has done so much, as I said, to keep Roosevelt's flame alive. So how wonderful that he's here tonight to open this program. Um, I also want to introduce another great supporter of history for whom all the history educators in this country are deeply indebted, um, somebody who's infused history in our public schools and has really helped breathe new life into the extraordinary historical society, and that's our friend Dick Gilder. So I just want to really thank him. And in bringing up uh, Bill Vanden Heuvel, the only thing that could top Bill Vanden Heuvel's uh, devotion to Roosevelt is the fact that today our governor re has restored Franklin Roosevelt's 1932 Packard and drove it to the opening of the new Kosciuszko Bridge. So what, what an auspicious way to kick off a Roosevelt program. Welcome Ambassador Bill Vanden Heuvel. <clears throat> Thank you, Jennifer. Jennifer is responsible for this building. She's the one who had the dream and the vision and the creative and the political skills to make this come about. And it's been a remarkable contribution to the city of New York as a place where people can talk ideas and policies. And it's, I'm very pleased to be part of it. Thank you, Jennifer, for all, all your work in that. I'm here tonight to introduce a Renaissance man, and it's a wonderful opportunity for me to refresh your minds and mine about the extraordinary contributions that Lewis Lillman has made to our city and to our state and to our country. He has uh, had a brilliant career that's embraced many worlds. In the business world, his creativity at a very young age allowed him to bring a company that began the the darling of Wall Street, and enabled him to have the resources to move in many different directions. He went to the financial world where he was a managing partner at one stage of his life with Morgan Stanley. He is, uh, he, he, uh, in the political world, I don't know how many of you remember one of the most exciting races that we've had in New York State history, when in 1982, uh, Lou Lerman challenging Mario Cuomo, who was then running for the first time, and in a race that was thought to be cut and dried, came within less than 100,000 votes of uh, denying a political career to probably both father and son. So uh, <laughs> Lou Lerman's race, though, was a skillful model. It was a modern campaign. It was the first time that you saw resources organized in a way that was different, young, creative, reached out. And uh, I'm only sorry that he didn't pursue a, a further political career, but 1982 was a banner year. And then family, faith, and philanthropy, those are words that are part of Lou Lerman. And he's done great justice to all of them. But I want to say a word, though, about him as a teacher, and as an author, and as a writer, and as a historian. Somehow or other, he entered into a partnership with this wonderful man, Richard Gilder. And the two of them have absolutely revolutionized the concept of history and how it should be taught. And I think we live in an age particularly where it's very disturbing. Maybe it is because of age it's disturbing. To see young people so careless and reckless about pursuing the context of history. But it's a very, it, the Lerman-Gilder partnership has done a great deal to establish that. 
and it was recognized by the President of the United States in the 2005 when they received the National Humanity Award and it was directly specified that they received it because of their contribution to American history. Uh, Lincoln was, of course, the centerpiece. Uh, how Roosevelt got into this game, I'm not quite sure. I'm looking forward to hearing it tonight. But Lincoln, of course, was the moral center of the country, as they saw it, and properly so. And we miss Harold here tonight, especially because of all of the events that have gone on in this year, this is the one that he would have loved to have presided over. But the, it, taking from Lincoln uh, the meaning of, of the majesty of our country has been a very thoughtful and creative idea. They're responsible for the Lincoln Prize, the best writing in, about the Lincoln era every year. They're responsible for the Washington Prize. But I wanted to just read a quote from Arthur Schlesinger, who was a, a great historian, certainly the best of his generation, and a great founder and helpmate in so many of the Roosevelt Enterprises. Arthur wrote in the last year of his life that history is to a nation as memory is to an individual. As, per as persons deprived of memory become disoriented, not knowing where they've been or where they're going, so a nation lacking conception of the past will be disabled in dealing with its present and its future. That's a message that I hope is read widely throughout our country every year. And nothing would please me, oh, sorry, nothing would please me more than to see a reversal of attitude in our public and private schools in the teaching of history. That's been the message of Lou Lerman, that children have to know what this country is about. Your politics isn't nearly as important as your knowledge, but you can't have politics or a position unless you have that knowledge. So, Lou, in many ways, is the voice of our forefathers. He's talking for Washington and the Constitution of the United States. He's talking about Abraham Lincoln, the Emancipation Proclamation, and that wonderful second inaugural address and the Gettysburg Address. And yes, he's talking for Franklin Roosevelt, when he says we have nothing to fear but fear itself, and when he talks about the four freedoms, and when he defines the economic rights of American citizens, as he did in 1944. So tonight is a very special occasion. It's an honor for me, and it's a privilege for all of us to have this opportunity to hear Lou Norman tell us some more of the story of Winston Churchill and Franklin Delano Roosevelt a partnership that made the history of the 20th century very different than it would have been. Lou, well, it's a great pleasure to welcome you. So Mr. Lincoln said, it's time to put on my spectacles. Ambassador, I think uh, our friendship goes back almost as far as mine with Dick Gilder. I think 50 years uh, would make it uh, around uh, around number and accurate as well. I thank you for the introduction. Uh, your words, of course, have always been inspiring, even in your mayoral campaign with John Lindsay. <laughs> so let us now dwell upon the most colossal war of human history, especially upon the Anglo-American alliance in World War II. At the onset of war, Anglophobia was a commonplace among civilian and military leaders in Washington. More than a century of bad blood had followed World War I, not least because of Britain's failure to repay its debts it's World War I debts to America. In Britain, condescension toward its former colonies still prevail, primarily among the British elites. Appeasement and isolationism preoccupied 
both countries. Some Americans believed that sophisticated British leaders such as Winston Churchill and John Maynard Keynes might be a slippery bunch who would fleece America in order to keep the British Empire intact. One British officer would write, and I quote him, some Americans are curiously liable to suspect that they are going to be outsmarted by the subtle British. Because we British sometimes do such stupid things that the Americans cannot take them at face value, but suspect them of being part of some dark design. The leaders of the United Kingdom and of the United States also had to overcome widespread doubt and distrust within the ranks, whereas Churchill himself never doubted that the full support of the United States was indispensable to defeat Hitler. In time, President Roosevelt would become a willing, full partner for Churchill, but FDR would wait until Pearl Harbor in December 19. 41, nearly 18 months after the fall of France. In the meantime, FDR would escalate U.S. cooperation with Churchill. By the time of Pearl Harbor, Hitler had already invaded Russia in June of 1941. Thus was born the de facto Anglo-American Soviet alliance on December 7, 1941. Working under Roosevelt and Churchill were many levels of military and civilian leaders, some of whom did embrace the trust and the team spirit necessary for victory. But on neither side of the Atlantic in 1942 was the team spirit pervasive, all appearances and propaganda to the contrary notwithstanding. In Washington, Secretary of State Cordell Hull Secretary of the Treasury Henry Morgenthau and their deputies, among others, among many others, shed their Anglophobia reluctantly. But U.S. Army Chief of Staff George Marshall and Supreme Commander in Europe Dwight Eisenhower would supervise many officers who would make the alliance effective, and others remained Anglophobes, most notably uh, Admiral. King, the Chief of Naval Operations. Among important civilian officials of the Alliance who aimed at cooperation were Harry Hopkins, Averill Harriman, well known to the Ambassador, uh, Lord Beaverbrook, and Anthony, Anthony Eden. Historians tend to emphasize that Churchill, Roosevelt, and company had won the war in the West and in the Pacific but less acknowledged is the fact that it was the Soviet army that had destroyed the bulk of the German armed forces in the East. Indeed, 80% of German soldiers who were killed in battle, four out of five were killed on the Eastern Front in battle with the Soviet armies. In the end, there would be unconditional victory for the Anglo-American-Russian alliance, but World War II would conclude with FDR dead, Churchill out of office, and Joseph Stalin in dictatorial control of all of Eastern Europe. Despite their best intentions, the Prime Minister and the President could not win the peace. Let us now consider the leaders of the Anglo-American alliance. Churchill and FDR were patricians of great ambition, inspired not least by their elite families and their famous forebears. Roosevelt would prove the better grassroots politician, having built a political organization in the Hudson Valley. FDR would enter New York politics when the progressive Theodore Roosevelt was probably the most famous American in the world. Now, politics was different for Churchill. His heart would beat to the rhythm of debate in Parliament, not to the noise 
of grassroots politics. By nature and circumstances, FDR was a superior politician, much more attuned to public opinion. But even in early 1941, after three presidential victories, FDR did not preside over a decisive congressional majority, thus reinforcing his natural caution. Churchill, on the other hand, governed a large majority coalition throughout the war. He seldom had to worry about serious parliamentary revolt. But FDR must fight two campaigns for the presidency during the war, 1940 and 1944. Mr. Lincoln fought only one presidential election during the Civil War in November 1864. But Churchill himself would face no, absolutely no parliamentary general election until July 1945, at the end of war in Europe, whereupon he was summarily dismissed from office by the British voters. Churchill's character and manner were more straightforward than that of Roosevelt. FDR, in fact, was practiced at deception as he himself readily acknowledged. He told Secretary of the Treasury Henry Morgenthau that, you know, I am a juggler, and I never let my left hand know what my right hand does. Secretary of the Interior Harold Ickes would say to Roosevelt himself, you won't even talk frankly with people who are loyal to you, the loyalty of whom you are fully convinced. Roosevelt's devoted speechwriter, Robert Sherwood, wrote that, and I quote him, if either the president or the prime minister could be called a student of Machiavelli, it was surely Franklin Roosevelt. However, the prime minister was himself a complex mixture of actor and warrior. He could alternate quickly between charmer and curmudgeon, but Churchill's true feelings tended always to show through. He rarely bothered to hide them. He did not hold back tears, even in public, often reduced to sobbing in Parliament. FDR was more circumspect, much more circumspect. However, Churchill was more tightly wound, more focused, more intense than Roosevelt. He would not rest from prosecuting the war, nor could he relax, as FDR did with his stamp collection and his naval encyclopedias. Churchill, in fact, would only paint one picture, a hobby which he loved and was extremely productive at. He would only paint one picture during the entire Second World War. Indeed, General Hastings Ismay Churchill's patient military aide, his liaison to the British Chiefs of Staff, would make a joke about the seriousness of the Prime Minister. Churchill is the great military genius of history. He can use one division on three fronts at the same time. <laughs> the Prime Minister's imagination would surely occasionally overcome his grasp of reality. Both the Prime Minister and the President did love bold strokes of action. Attorney General Jackson emphasized that Roosevelt liked novel ideas, bold courses, and dramatic actions. And he liked the sort of men who could com come up with such suggestions. The man who influenced Roosevelt the most was the one who would marshal him the way that he was going would provide reasons and arguments for what he wanted to do. But General Marshall, FDR's Army Chief of Staff, proved unreceptive to FDR's charm. Nor did the stoic Marshall laugh at the President's joke. But, he, but Roosevelt nevertheless named Marshall Chief of Staff. Maybe because of that. 
From his earliest years as an only child, FDR's wealth would underwrite his every wish, just as Churchill's overweening self-assurance stemmed in part from his ducal lineage, of which he was very proud indeed. Young Winston, early in life, did aim self-consciously. As a very young man in his early 20s, he aimed to be, as he said, a very great man. Even to surpass his father, Lord Randolph Churchill, at a one time Chancellor of the Exchequer. Now, both warlords were committed democratic leaders, but they did have different personalities. FDR wanted very much to be liked, simply wanted to be liked at Groton, at Harvard, and in politics. He was most comfortable with people of his own social background. Indeed, Eleanor Roosevelt would observe, and I quote her, Franklin is not at ease with people not of his own class. This was an extraordinary comment about one of the world's great humanitarian politicians. FDR was also a man of in intuition and impulse. His inner life was opaque, even to those who knew him best. Robert Sherwood, his loyal speechwriter, wrote, and I quote him, I tried continually to study him, to try to look beyond his charming and amusing and warmly affectionate surface into his heavily forested interior. That's a remarkable metaphor, meaning that as try as Sherwood did, he never was able to grasp the man for whom he was writing speeches. Anna Roosevelt, FDR's daughter, would say no one knew FDR, even members of his own family. Now, it is true that Churchill was less amiable than FDR, but he was often brutally frank, even in certain cases, brutal. He was relentless, more on the job in the way he drove his subordinates. As the king's first minister, he was a superb parliamentarian, a confident, hands-on war leader. But his generals and his admirals found him maddening. Neither Churchill nor Roosevelt was a modest man. They did not suffer fools gladly. The prime minister could see no reason, no reason at all, why a man or woman engaged in anything quite so important and interesting as a war should want to take leave, spend an evening at home, or even go to bed early. Churchill was notorious for going to bed at 3 a.m., 4 a.m., 5 a.m., and his generals were exhausted because they had to rise and be at command posts, not later than 8. Of course, Churchill did have a grand strategy, but he would micromanage tirelessly. FDR, on the other hand, I think it can be correctly said that he was a big picture man, even a bit distant. He did leave much of the detailed business of war to his senior subordinates, wisely relying to some extent on the massive resource base, which he understood of men and materials which American generals and business leaders could mobilize. The president did choose wisely his leaders of the armed forces. Men such as General Marshall and, of course, General Eisenhower, among many others. So, too, his senior admirals, King and Nimitz and Spruance, among many others. But as historian Warren Kimball wrote, FDR would often dismiss detail with a cavalier wave of the hand. With the possible exception, Kimball noted, of the promotion list for the US Navy, which he monitored, monitored painstakingly. I think some of you uh, are well aware that Franklin Roosevelt was the Assistant Secretary of the Navy in World War I under Woodrow Wilson, and he did a splendid job. Indeed, he ran the, the entire department as the Assistant Secretary of the Navy.
from hard experience, Churchill had mastered the kind of organization he must build in order to lead a far-flung war machine. This he had learned from his cabinet positions in World War I, during which he witnessed the struggle between the frock coats, that is, the politicians, and the brass hats, that is, the generals. During the New Deal and during the war, according to Arthur Schlesinger Jr., FDR was the supreme improviser. Schlesinger also wrote that FDR's favorite technique was to keep grants of authority incomplete, jurisdictions uncert uncertain, charters overlapping. The result of this competitive theory of administration was often confusion and exasperation on the operating level, but it did put FDR in charge making the ultimate decision. To his diary, Secretary of War Stimson confided that FDR was the poorest administrator I have ever worked under with respect to the orderly procedure and routine of his performance. If uh, the great Secretary of War Stimson were here, I would have to say, but he did win the war. But FDR's big decisions on war were sound and successful. Now, important Anglo-American personnel problems would appear at the outset of the war, exemplified by Joseph P. Kennedy, about whom we were just talking, Ambassador. Joseph Kennedy was the US ambassador to the court of St. James. He repeatedly announced publicly that Britain was, in his word, finished. FDR was much more than a match for this ambassador. The president concluded Kennedy had to go, and he deftly got rid of him. In addition to Kennedy, I focus on my book, in my book, on major civilian and military leaders, but also on dozens of key figures, not so well known, but very important. Indeed. For example, among these leaders are the super spies William Donovan and William Stevenson, Harry Hopkins, Ambassador Wynant, Lord Beaverbrook, Lord Lothian, Lord Halifax, Anthony Eden, Anthony Eden, General Marshall, General Eisenhower. I could go on and I, I should mention Henry Morgenthau, Avril Harriman, John Maynard Keynes, the Soviet spy at Treasury. Harry Dexter White, Henry Morgenthau's chief deputy at the US Treasury Department. Other chapters consider Pearl Harbor, Yalta, Russian spy masters, and the State Department under FDR. Indeed, FDR ran the State Department. He was his own State Department. But I shall tell you little more about most of these fascinating characters. Maybe you will then want to buy the book. <laughs> Alone among the big three, Churchill, Roosevelt, and Stalin, the Prime Minister would make the exhausting travel at great personal risk to keep the alliance together, surely in the first three years, always trying to reduce misunderstandings by speaking directly with his American and his Russian allies. In fact, the Prime Minister was the oldest of the three, and his health was at, was at times very fragile. But Stalin would hug Kremlin security, partly because he feared flying. But most of all, he did, not, and he did not trust his ambitious Bolshevik leaders who might bring off a coup in his absence. The prime minister's travel astonished his colleagues. The tireless Churchill would meet Roosevelt 11 times during the war almost always in North America, except at Casablanca, Cairo, Tehran, and Yalta. Of the Prime Minister's courageous travel by air and ship into the war zones, General Douglas MacArthur would write, and I quote him, foreign and hostile lands may be the duty of young pilots, but for a statesman burdened by the world's cares, it is an act of inspiring gallantry and valor. Of the Victoria Cross, the British Medal of Honor, MacArthur would say, no one of those 
who wears it deserves to wear it more than Churchill himself. Churchill, by the way, he, he regretted that he never won the Victoria Cross, even though he was involved as a young man, as a cavalry officer, in three wars in the British Empire. Unlike uh, Churchill's consistent policy of command through written orders, and he directed all of his staff to communicate through written orders in order to avoid confusion and to fix responsibility and decision, Roosevelt, on the other hand, followed a policy of keeping his meetings with the Joint Chiefs of Staff off the record. FDR would even veto General Marshall's formal request in November 1942 that minutes be kept of the President's meetings with the Joint Chiefs of Staff. I mean, Roosevelt's strategy was understandable. He wanted to preserve his flexibility. Uh, he was always sensitive to what they could not plan for. Despite his great talents, this character trait of FDR to preserve his flexibility would to some extent hinder accountability in the team, hinder its communication and its decision making during the New Deal and during World War II. But let it also be said that FDR did secretly record meetings in the Oval Office. By 1941, key American cabinet members did favor U.S. entry into the war, including Navy Secretary Frank Knox and Secretary of War Henry Stimson. They were ahead of the president and of public opinion, of which FDR was the consummate master. Despite his landslide victory in November 1940, the president's mind was preoccupied by his 1940 campaign pledge to American mothers not to send their sons to war. But Roosevelt did, in fact, raise the temperature of American belligerence in 1940 and in 1941. The evidence shows that FDR did think far ahead with considerable foresight. With, with, with Roosevelt's approval, U.S. military authorities began actively planning for war even in late 1940, one year before Pearl Harbor. It was then that Admiral Stark produced the famous dog memo on global war strategy, which led to the American-British-Canadian Conference of early 1941 in Washington. There, the conference would confirm a Germany-first strategy in the event of war, almost one year before the Japanese attack. FDR surely did anticipate war, perhaps as early as 1938, probably earlier than any active American politician. All of the allies, Britain and Russia, not just the United States, had been to some extent unprepared for World War II, despite clear warnings. The British and the French, already at war since September 1939, had been caught unprepared for the German blitzkrieg of May 1940. Despite many warnings, Stalin had been caught totally unready for the German invasion of June 1941. The U.S. government was not fully prepared for a war with Japan, a war that FDR did expect. Indeed, Roosevelt was shocked by Pearl Harbor, but he was resolute in the event. By the end of the war, the massive American production machine would supply not only all of U.S. domestic and war needs, as well as the Eastern Front, plus the Western Front in Europe, as well as the all-out war in the Pacific. As a result of the dominant role of the United States, the Prime Minister would, in 1943, especially in the second half of 1943, become the junior partner in the Anglo-American alliance. The Roosevelt-Churchill honeymoon deteriorated along with the health of both men. There were sincere policy differences. Two, confirming the rule of statecraft 
that nations have no permanent friends, only vital interests. Anglo-American disputes were increasingly marked by, different, by differing strategies for the post-war world, especially how to contain an expansive, victorious Soviet communist empire. Stalin's armies were now astride all of Eastern Europe. Now, along the road to Allied victory, there were plenty of grievous misjudgments. Some of them, many, many years after the war, a bit amusing. For example, in, 19, in the 1930s, as an early advocate of British Air Force expansion, Churchill would declare, I quote him, an airplane cannot sink a battleship because the armor is too thick. And in early 1938, Churchill would say, the air menace against properly armed and protected ships of war will not be of a decisive character. Tell that to the Japanese Navy in 1942. Devastating Japanese aircraft carrier attacks on the British Navy in the Pacific would shock Churchill to the quick. In the spring of 1941, Stalin himself refu refused to believe authentic warnings from numerous sources, including his spies in Japan, that a German invasion was imminent. This refusal, despite the fact that Hitler had already mobilized three million German soldiers for the invasion, obvious to everybody else. Stalin's myopia would cause disaster and death to strike millions of the Russian people. Few know that 28 million Russian citizens perished in World War II, 8 million in battle and about 20 million civilians. Now, here is the best one of all. U.S. Admiral William Leahy, Chief of Staff to FDR and Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, would say, I quote him, the atomic bomb will never go off. And I speak as an expert on explosives. He was a great man and I'm sure he would like to expunge, expunge that sentence from the record. Despite defeats, large and small, FDR and Churchill did foresee the ultimate victory of the Anglo-American-Russian alliance. Churchill, Roosevelt and Company, Studies in Character and Statecraft, my book is but my own very modest tribute to the victorious Anglo-American alliance a very special relationship originating in World War II, which persists to this very day. Let us now listen to General Eisenhower's major tribute to the Anglo-American victory given at the Guild Hall on June 12, 1945. I quote General Eisenhower, no one could alone have brought about this result. Had I possessed the military skill of a Marlborough, the wisdom of Solomon, the understanding of Lincoln, I still would have been helpless without the loyalty, the vision, the generosity of thousands upon thousands of British and Americans. Some of them were my companions in the high command. Many were enlisted men and junior officers carrying the fierce brunt of the battle in the field and many others were back in the United States and here in Great Britain, in London. Moreover, back of us all, were always our great national war leaders and their civil and military staffs that supported and encouraged us through every trial, every test. The whole was one great team. Thank you very much. So we'll now have a 
question and answer period. We have a student um, coming around with a microphone, so if you'll wait for the microphone, I'll choose, but the answers will come from Mr. Lehrman. And then after the Q&A, I hope you'll join us upstairs in the Four Freedoms Room for a reception, and as Mr. Lehrman alluded to, a book signing. So uh, we'll go to the Q&A now. Thank you. There have got to be some people here that don't agree. So criticism and comments, as well as questions, are welcome. Uh, is it on? Yes, it is on. Yeah. Remarkable. Thank you very, very much, OK? And I'm going to buy several of the books, OK? Um, I think you rightly point out. I'll sign out, all of them. Oh, no, I, you, you will. I guarantee it. Uh, you rightly point out that both Churchill and Roosevelt had extraordinary military talent at their disposal, correct? They were really competent people. Yes. But isn't it true that Roosevelt routinely overruled his military leaders? I mean, routinely? I, wouldn't, I, I would not uh, use that uh, modifier. Um, it is certain that Churchill quarreled with his military leaders even more than Roosevelt. But Roosevelt overruled his military advisors, Henry Stimson and George Marshall in particular, on major strategic decisions were in fact on the authority of the commander in chief of the army and of the navy according to the constitution. So, so in matters of uh, tactical and strategic matters in the field, uh, he rarely um, overruled them. Indeed, he, he delegated authority uh, quite substantially on, the, on his trust of his admirals and his generals. However, for example, I think you have in mind um, the, the decision that General Marshall and Henry Stimson made to conduct a cross-channel invasion in 1942. And they tried to persuade uh, President Roosevelt that 1942, they would be ready. And Mr. Churchill and uh, General Sir Allen Brooke, who was the chief of staff of the British Army, said, absolutely not. It's impossible. We can't be ready. I mean, you didn't declare war until December 7th, 1941. You don't, you have 300,000 men in the American Army. How are you going to get them over here? How are you going to land them successfully and supply them and, so, and carry them through to, uh, uh, to Germany? So making a long story short, this went on for months. Uh, Churchill and Roosevelt agreed, and Roosevelt told Marshall and Stimson there would be no cross channel invasion in 1942. Indeed, there was none in 1943, and the Americans were ready, and the British were ready in 1944, as we know, in June of 1944, the Normandy invasion. So Roosevelt had to Indeed. Uh, that was also a cooperative venture. Uh, so when, when uh, FDR said to Marshall and to Stimson, there will be no invasion, cross-channel invasion, because it's premature. We are not ready. We can't do it. It's impossible. Um, Churchill said, we have to put the boys to work, fighting. And Roosevelt himself wanted American soldiers in the war. Indeed, uh, he wanted the American soldiers in the war before the congressional elections of November of uh, 1942, but they didn't quite make it. The invasion of North Africa occurred just after um, the election. Uh, Roosevelt, as I said, he did not have a decisive majority. Uh, even after his three presidential elections, and he, he believed in 1942, if he could get the boys into North Africa and they would vindicate his strategy, or his and Churchill's strategy by victory, he could finally get his, his, his decisive majority. Thank you for your wonderful speech tonight. I just wonder, did you happen to get into the life of Pamela, Churchill, Hayward, Harriman, uh, and uh, then our ambassador to, uh, to France? Because she was very close to Churchill and close, close to some of those men, too. I did have a line about 
Pamela Digby Churchill Harriman. And I decided to omit it because there's just so much more to be said about this, this woman and her relationships uh, with Edward R. Murrow and um, Averill Harriman, not to mention her marriage to the Prime Minister's son, Randolph Churchill. It reminds me uh, of the argument uh, when Randolph Churchill discovered that his wife, Pamela Digby uh, Churchill, was having an affair with uh, Harriman right under the Prime Minister's nose at the Dorchester Ho Hotel in London. So, that was one of their fiercest uh, fights. But they've been fighting ever since Randolph was a, a boy. Um, so that Churchill would say of Randall, of Randolph Churchill, his son, his only son, I love Randolph, but I do not like him. Thank you, Lou. Good talk. I'm oh, Michael Myers. I'm executive director of the New York Civil Rights Coalition. Tell me, did um, at what point, if any, did Franklin Roosevelt know that his days were numbered, and how, if if so, that factored into decision making? And when did Harry Truman get brought into uh, the war strategy and how to win? At some point, being being on the inside. Those are two great questions in there very closely related. We know that Mr. Churchill, uh, who was not happy with doctors, had a heart specialist. And he was examined in 1944 before his decision, uh, well before his decision to run for uh, a fourth and final term. Uh, or a fourth and what might have been a, a final term. Did, did I say, I'm sorry. They're easily confused. <laughs> so, um, so Roosevelt did have a heart specialist. And he was given the opinion before he, he chose to run for public office that he would not survive his second term. And he was not alone in knowing this. And the decision was made not to disclose it. Very, very few people knew about it. But of course, his doctor did. Um, uh, an outstanding man, a specialist who was called in much too late. He should have been on the case uh, long before uh, when Dr. McIntyre had the entire case in his own hands. So that the uh, second question, which is related, when did he bring Harry Truman into all the intimate strategic factors, both domestically and internationally, that he needed to know? And the fact is, that he did not do so. Uh, one could go on, but uh, Truman was himself very capable. He knew what was going on. He paid. He had been a, a an outstanding soldier, an officer in World War One. He was very worldly. He was in, he was in fact a student of history. So he knew what was going on, but he was not taken into. FDR's competence. For example, he knew nothing about the development of the atomic bomb, and it was he who, in the end, was going to drop it. Yes, could, could you speak a little bit about uh, Roosevelt and Churchill's relationship with Stalin and their perceptions of Stalin? And in particular, there's that depiction of Roosevelt being too trusting of Stalin and Churchill being, you know, trying to get FDR to be a little more wary of Stalin and the Russian Soviet ambitions for after the war. Well, I think you've uh, summarized it in your question. Um, no, it was, it's not outdated. I mean, it, it's consistent with the evidence. You know, the, uh, uh, there is enough historiography on um, President Roosevelt and on uh, on Mr. Churchill to and enough documentary evidence to settle these questions more or less decisively, so that um, we do know that um, 
FDR wanted a very special relationship with Stalin. No man was more self-confident of his personal charm than Franklin Roosevelt. I mean, he could, as, as the saying goes, I'm not inventing anything here, he could charm the birds out of the trees. And everyone fell for him uh, and, and loved him. Um, so he believed that having charmed everybody throughout his entire life successfully, um, that he could charm Stalin. And for two years, he, tr he tried to get a separate meeting with Stalin without Churchill. And uh, he never got it. However, at Tehran and at um, Yalta, Stalin, uh, Roosevelt made a bid for Stalin's friendship by demeaning Churchill himself. We have the record. Um, I, I, heard, I heard another question. I, I'm going to just try. So um, he, um, he referred to uh, Churchill as a Victorian, a man of the British Empire, and uh, did so sort of with a, a, an elbow uh, a, a, and a chuckle. And um, th this was at uh, Tehran. And it was, there were many good sides to Churchill and to Roosevelt. This was one of the bad sides of, of Roosevelt. He, he uh, took advantage of Churchill in the last two years of the war uh, inasmuch as he was clearly the dominant factor in the entire alliance. So that um, it is true also that uh, Churchill wanted uh, Roosevelt to be wary of Stalin. However, Churchill himself uh, was very solicitous uh, of Stalin, not least because he wanted Stalin to finish the war in the east. It was the Russian army which was destroying the German army and saving the, the lives of British soldiers and American soldiers so that both Churchill and Roosevelt um, played their part in uh, soliciting Stalin's uh, good offices. Roosevelt even more than Churchill. Churchill, in his reporting of the Boer War, the River War, you wouldn't anticipate that what he would become. What transformed him from these whiny letters to his mother to becoming a giant? Yes. Well, I, I, everybody heard the question. Um, uh, Churchill wooed his mother, so to speak, as if she were a mistress. She was extremely well connected in the social and political elites of London. And very important appointments that he sought as a young cavalry lieutenant in India, she could arrange it for him. I mean, I'm not going to get into the gossip. The gossip about uh, Jenny Churchill is legion. I mean, the number of men who were attracted to her <laughs> and whom she attracted, um, including uh, the Prince of Wales. Uh, so that she was in and out of the great houses and some say the great bedrooms of, of London. And she was always plumping for her boy, Winston. Winston was completely unselfconscious in asking uh, his mother to go directly to Admiral this or General that, and this is the appointment that he wanted. For example, he, here he was stationed as a subaltern in southern India, playing polo and educating himself. I mean, a massive educational program he assigned himself. Um, and, but he wanted, to, he wanted to fight in battle. Why? He wanted to win medals. He wanted to be a great man. He wanted to go to parliament. And the, best way to become famous in England was to be a brave soldier and to be bemedaled. And so he became, uh, so he participated in three wars in the most brave 
one might even say reckless forms of courage at the battlefront, both in Northwest India, where we have met our, our match in Afghanistan, and he also, um, uh, he, he, before the Boer War, it, it was the Sudan in the great battle in Egypt where he was participated in the last cavalry charge of the entire British uh, army history, and then of course, the Boer War in uh, 1899 and uh, 1900. Indeed, he even sought an appointment in, uh, to go uh, observe the Spanish-Cuban War in 1895. That was his first trip to the United States of America where he met a good friend of his mother. So that Churchill, uh, Churchill was a young man in a hurry to be famous. Um, he was self-educated in many ways, even though he was from a ducal family, the Duke of Marlborough's family. He was self-educated. He was educated at the, the Royal Academy at Sandhurst, the military academy. Uh, might call it, I, I know, if, there, uh, if there's a West Pointer in the crowd, please d don't uh, tell anybody I made the comparison with West Point, with, with Sandhurst. But um, he did, acquit himself well in all three of these war, and as a result, he became a writer. He, he was one of the few British officers who held a paid post, very well paid, as a British correspondent to London newspapers. This was a very irregular assignment for a British army officer, and as a result, we now have a corpus of Churchill's own writings, legion in number, 20 million words he wrote. I'm not talking about the words, the words that were written about him. He wrote 20 million words in books, essays, biographies, histories. Just an astonishing record. I think that's one of the reasons why he has charmed a, a large part of the American um, citizenry. Was there a fundamental disagreement between them with how to handle the problem the Jewish people were experiencing uh, between the St. Louis being denied, the kinder transport, bombing access roads, et cetera? How did that work out in the dynamics between the two men? So uh, I'll take them one at a time, if I may. Churchill was very much involved and very aggressive in his support of the Balfour Declaration. Uh, always believed in a, a Jewish homeland. Uh, as the phrase goes, he had many Jewish friends. And they were very loyal to him, and they believed in him. And they, they supported him in, through thick and thin. Um, he also um, took up uh, the cause of, of, uh, of the Jews in Europe very early and very aggressively, and, and many of his early speeches uh, talked about the, the grave injustice that was being done by um, the European peoples in general and the Germans in particular uh, with, the, with the Jewish people in Germany. Um, and he continued that, even in his second ministry uh, in, uh, between 1951 and 1955. I mean, it, 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 I don't want to give the impression that he didn't have mixed feelings. For example, in the Bolshevik Revolution, where Jews played a very prominent role in the Bolshevik Revolution in 1917, uh, he did write an essay where he talked about the brilliance and the achievement of the, the Jews unparalleled in history. And yet, here, the, uh, the Russian Jews who participated in the Bolshevik Revolution uh, participated in some of the most violent atrocities um, of history. So that some people have misinterpreted that essay he wrote, which talked about the exaltation of the Jews in particular throughout history and the, their stooping to conquer in 1917 through the Bolshevik Revolution as a criticism of the Jews. I've read the essay twice and I don't see it. In the case of Roosevelt, he, he gets a hard rap uh, for, as you mentioned, the St. Louis and the den denial 
uh, for refugees um, and, and their desire to find a place that hundreds of thousands, millions were trapped in, in, in Europe who didn't take the chance after the Kristallnacht um, in 1938 to get out of Germany while they could. So that um, he was preoccupied with so many other issues that he would not, he would not um, make an exception to the laws of the United States. Remember, the Fort de McCumber Act of 1924 had prescribed limitations on Northwestern European immigration into the United States. And as a result, uh, there was a limited amount that he was enabled to do to admit Jews ad hoc against the congressional legislation on the books. For example, I can, I can tell you what the, the statistics are. There were, Roosevelt himself ordered that, that the entire Jewish, German, Austrian quota be combined for immigration to the United States and assigned to the Jewish refugees who were applying for refuge in the United States. It was only a, a small fraction of those who were trapped and murdered in, in Europe, but he did do that uh, to the extent of his ability. That's true. Uh, it was a it was a decision taken at the highest military level not to bomb the the railroad tracks into uh, Auschwitz. Even there, um, it is very hard to hold Roosevelt himself responsible because the advice he got was that it would not materially affect the what the Germans were doing at Auschwitz, and. Uh, Nobody, nobody knew on first-hand evidence exactly what was going on there, and nobody knew to what extent a bombing of Auschwitz uh, would, in fact, incinerate the inmates themselves. For example, we know that um, aerial bombing in, in Germany uh, all the way through the war was very inaccurate. I mean, we sent thousands and thousands of uh, bombers, British and Americans, 47% of the bombers, 47% of the pilots, of, of, of the American pilots who bombed Germany never came back alive. They died. So that, and their bombs never fell effectively until later in the war when we perfected the bombing devices. So that in the end, uh, I can see why Roosevelt took the course of least, least resistance. I think that's it, and I thank you very much.